Welcome to another episode of What's Up Prof. Hello, Walter. Hello, Martin. <laughs> How are you doing? Why do you always laugh when I say it? <laughs> I like the way you say it. <laughs> yes. Uh, are you doing okay? Don't ask. Okay, so we'll just skip that part again. We'll skip that, yeah. Especially when we look in the mirror. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's open with a word of prayer. I we, need we need it, it. And yeah, we definitely need it. Our Heavenly Father, we need you every day, every hour, and every minute. Please help us through this discussion and that we can, enlight, can get enlightened minds but by what you want us to learn. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Martin. We are busy talking about preparation mm. for what is coming. And uh, we looked at world events and we looked at the seriousness of the times we are living in and the closeness of the yeah. final events. And the question, of course, is how do you get ready? And we're not talking about uh, planting vegetables now and no, 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 that's making sure that you're, you have a safe haven and all of those things. I'm talking about preparation for heaven. And that's, that, that's a tall order, right? That is, because we, a lot of focus goes on, on how to prepare for the trouble. Yes. But to prepare for what's after the trouble, the Blessed hope. Yes. That is a different story. Are we ready to be co-inhabitors with unfallen beings? Mm. It's a tall order. That's a tall order, right? So let's look at being a partaker of the divine nature. There were two trees in the Garden of Eden. And these two trees were to determine the path of humanity. So there were two choices. Mm. You either chose the one or you chose the other one. There were not three and there were not more than three. It is an issue of black and white. Yeah. There were no shades of gray. So two characters to develop, either the similitude of Satan or the similitude of Christ. And they had a choice. Mm -hmm. And those two choices have remained throughout history. That's it. Right? Satan packaged the two choices in a thousand variants, 10,000 variants, but they're just two packages, no more. It's mm -hmm. either the one or the other. Not in between. Nothing in between. And it doesn't seem as if people want to adopt the divine nature. They like to think about it. Mm -hmm. They like to even praise it. But to incorporate it, that's a different question, right? Yeah, because it always has to do with letting go of something. Yes. So there are many, many verses in the Bible that talk about being a partaker. Mm. So let's look at some of them and see what you can be a partaker of. Partaker is to be part and parcel of the process, to be one that is involved in it. And not only as an observer, but a real participant. Mm -hmm. So when thou sawest the thief, then thou consentest with him and has been a partaker with adulterers. All right, so you can be a partaker with adulterers. And in a sense, everybody in humanity at some stage has probably been a partaker with adulterers. This is a, a, an association. But if you are a partaker, that means that you relish their activity. Mm -hmm. And uh, even if you don't 
actually take part if you in your mind let your mind wander in that direction you've already become a partaker right no. jesus mm -hmm. said so okay and you can be a partaker of hope yeah he's all together for our sakes for our sakes no doubt this is written that he that ploweth should plow hope and that he that threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope now, this is talking about a harvest, but it has a much deeper meaning, a spiritual meaning, yeah, right? Because to be part of the harvest, you have to have a certain mindset. You have to have a certain mindset, you're right. Well, what about verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 9? And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker thereof with you. So he wants to be part and parcel of the plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? So when you become a partaker, you become a partaker by grace. Oh yeah, that's the only way, not by anything that you do. No. So in other words, you become a partaker but even that is a gift. Yeah. Everything is a gift, right? From the very beginning. 1 Timothy 5.22 Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partake of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. So don't get involved with anything that is of a sinful nature. Otherwise you become a partaker. Yeah. You know, the thing is, Sometimes we lower the standard of what is sinful. So a small white lie is also actually a very serious thing. Yeah. You can actually say, tell a white lie for a good purpose. That's, that's yeah. But it's still a lie. It's right? still a lie. It's still a lie. I, I had to deal with a little case like that where somebody wanted to justify a little white lie. And, uh, well, it, it worked for good. But the question is, is it morally right? That's a problem. I mean, was it a white lie that Abraham told Pharaoh? It was a half-truth. <laughs> yeah, but you can justify. You can justify. You see, that's the same like a white lie. You can almost justify it. But yeah. is it right? Okay. No. Jesus never lied, right? Not once. According to the new translations, he did. Oh. Yes, he said, I am not going up to this feast. But in the old translation, in the King James says, I am not yet going up to this yeah. feast. You. So mm. it's, uh, it's very important. If you don't look at the little details, you will assume that Jesus told a white lie. Yeah. It's the same like the people blame him that he actually broke the Sabbath. Yes. Wow. Okay. 2 Timothy 1.8 Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. In other words, Martin, if things are not going so well, then uh, don't necessarily blame anyone or anything. It's part of the package. That's it. Uh, so if you want the good, uh, and you want to be a partaker of the good, that means you must also be prepared to be the partaker of the consequences, yeah. the backlash. Exactly. It actually goes both ways. If you want to be a partaker of the other side, you must also be ready to partake of the consequences. Okay, Second Timothy 2.6, The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Well, that's a nice promise. Does it always happen? Um, no. 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 But that's how it should be. Exactly, and that's what's promised in heaven. All right, but now let's take it to a spiritual level. If you are a laborer in another vineyard, in a spiritual vineyard, then this is actually a promise that you'll be a partaker of the fruits. Yes. 
the first partaker mm -hmm. of the fruits. That's quite a nice promise. Well, huh? that's a beautiful one. 1 Peter 5, 1. The elders which are amongst you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. That's confidence. That's it. So first, it was the suffering. But the reward, the glory, so much you will be a partaker of. All right, but what is glory? What does that stand for in the Bible? Mm -hmm. oh, character. Character, Martin. So you must be a partaker of the character that shall be revealed. So heaven has a particular nuance, a character. And that character in heaven is in harmony with the character of Christ. So if you want to know what the character of heaven is going to be like, then you have to study the character of Christ. Yeah. Second John 1 John 1.11, For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. So if you say to someone, I wish you well when you know that he's on an evil mission, <laughs> even if you don't take part in the evil mission, or even if you say it uh, basically to avoid conflict, <laughs> you, you become a partaker. Martin, do you, does one have to be very, very careful? Thinking of it, yes. It's amazing how careful we should be. How careful were Adam and Eve? Mm, they weren't. You have to be careful. They didn't expect it, right? Such a small thing. You see, once again, we come back to the small things. They thought God won't be so benign. No, no, it won't happen. Not, not just not happen. something small like this. Hey. Wow. Well, this scary one, Matthew 23, 30. And I say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Because Jesus said that they were partakers in the blood of the prophets even though they lived after them, right? And now the modern people say we wouldn't have done that. If they read what it says, they said we wouldn't have done that. Mm. But they've already transgressed mm. because they actually did. Mm. Because didn't Jesus die for them? Exactly. Why did he have to die for them? Because of sin. Because they were partakers. Your part, yeah. We are all partakers of the blood of the prophets because the prophets all testified of Christ and we are responsible for the blood of Christ. Therefore, we are responsible for all the prophets because yeah. they bore the same message. It's still relevant today. Romans fifteen twenty seven, It has pleased them verily and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. So we have to become partakers of the spiritual things. But when we do that, we must also be a partaker in the carnal things. We must also take care of them. Yeah, you minister to them. You have to minister to them. You can't just... No, leave it. Like you mentioned before. So if you just want to ditch somebody, yeah, it's not. No. Then you will have a problem. Uh, didn't Jesus say, said, I will be with you always? Yeah. So were you ever ditched? No. <laughs> no, he never. never ditches you, right? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Can we do the same? We have to not ditch anybody. Yeah. Okay. So if others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? So you can have power over someone. Mm -hmm. Somebody can look up to you and think you're wonderful. When in actual fact, you might not be so wonderful, right? Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. So when you are in Christ, you are part partaker of his power. Mm -hmm. But that's a responsibility. That's a big responsibility not to misuse it. Okay. 
1 Corinthians 9.13, do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? So if you become involved in the things of Christ, it is all-encompassing. All-encompassing. Mm. Eventually you become so involved that you also become a partaker of the benefits that come with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Hmm? So, Martin, have you changed your life? Have you gone from a secular world to a world where you are totally dependent on ministry? For sure. Hmm? Yeah. And was it a risk for you? For sure. It, Were you worried? It, it's a worldly risk. Were you worried? I think I was, yes, we were quite worried. But then when you start letting, I, I don't think there's anybody that's not worried once they have to start doing the decision to go that route. Okay. And what is it involved? I mean, I had the same thing. I was working at the university. I was the head of a department. Yeah, I had yeah. a professorship. And I had to make a choice to go into ministry. And it's a, it's a scary choice because basically you're dropping your worldly anchor. Yeah. That's, you're getting rid of it. You're actually cutting it off. That's, a, that's where the scary part is. There's nothing to fall back on. Nothing. Yeah. So in other words, you have to have faith because once Absolutely. you've cut that cord, mm -hmm. you're on your own, pal. Absolutely. So what, what does it involve? Trust. And faith. That's it. Everything. And even if that faith is pathetic, once you take that step, it grows quickly. Did he ever drop you after Not that? Not once. And in actual fact, it's, if you put yourself in the position like the Israelites before they went into the Jordan River, yes. it's the same thing. They were probably standing there, worried about everything. There they knew that they had to take a step and put their foot in the water and it would open. Uh, when it was at the Red Sea, God still... Yeah, yeah, he was... He was still prepared to overlook their, their unbelief. Yeah. And he opened it for them for before them. they went in because they were muttering and screaming and moaning. Exactly. Right? Not yeah. at the Jordan. There you have to put your foot in the altar. So if you want to be a partaker of the altar, then you have to minister at the altar. I don't know. Martin, I think many people will be called in the near future. I think it's already happening. To yeah. put their hands to the plow. 1 Corinthians 10, 17. For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh... Are they not which eat of the sacrifices, partakers of the altar? It's the same question. Mm -hmm. But now he's actually said we're all partakers of one bread. Mm. We're all part of Christ. That's it. The bread of life. Uh, are all the characters the same that are the partakers of the bread? No. Does that rile you sometimes? <laughs> <laughs> we work through it. <laughs> you work through it, okay. But now think about it. You're going to go to heaven one day. Exactly. By grace. Yeah. And those same characters might be there. Exactly. Or They're not going to be... You see, that's a wonderful thing. We're all partakers of the one bread. So all will be of one mind, but not necessarily one personality. Okay. And we don't know who is where on his spiritual journey. Mm. So we have to be patient, we have to be long-suffering, we have to, develop, have to develop all those character traits in order to be, as the Bible says, partakers of the Lord's table. Yeah. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partaker of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. What kind of spiritual food are you consuming? You can't be partaker of them both. Oh, even what are you listening to? What are you watching? 
Now, Martin, I've come across people that say, I will, I will partake of this food and spit out the pips. Yeah, I've heard that. Have you heard that? Mm -hmm. In other words, I'll keep that which is good and spit out that which is not acceptable. You see, so the problem is they take that Bible verse and distort it because where Jesus says, taste the spirit and hold on to what's good. It doesn't yeah. mean go and taste everything that there is, like alcohol and drugs and smoke. And, and see what's good in it. There's uh, nothing good in it. No. And in a false prophet or in a false prophecy, mm -hmm. uh, the devil likes to li let the lie ride on the back of truth. Of course. So, so can you keep the truth and spit out the pips or... Is it better to stick with the truth from the beginning? That's it. So if you have books, like we've d done one on the apocryphal books, we've showed how many pips are in those books. So why would you run to go through that? Yeah, you don't have to go to that if you have the real McCoy, right? I always ask, if you believe that we've got the spirit of prophecy given through by God, there's 100,000 plus pages to read, once you've gone, get, gone through all of those, then you can start reading something else. <laughs> okay. All right. But sometimes inadvertently mm. stuff comes your way and then you have to use discernment. Oh, for sure. But don't put yourself in harm's way from the beginning. Yeah. All right. The Bible says that if you want to be part of the hope, then you have to be part of the suffering. We've dealt with that. And to be a partaker is more than being an observer. But the great thing is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Wonderful that you can become partakers of the promise. Now, this promise was given to Abraham, wasn't it? Yeah, no, that's true. All Everybody that is the seed of, uh, is in Christ is the seed of Abraham. All right, now, would you think, Martin, that this verse in Ephesians 3 uh, would have irritated some of the Israelites? Oh, definitely, because they were the chosen. They were the chosen ones. And now he's telling them, no, 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 the Gentiles are now also partakers of the promise in Christ. Mm -hmm. And there are still people today who say that certain people are excluded. Mm -hmm. So must we develop a mindset of inclusiveness mm. if we want to go to heaven? You can't be prejudiced against whatever, yeah. against the race or prejudiced against this, that, or the other. You when have to accept that all have sinned and fall short. That's it. So in Christ, all are brothers and sisters. All are brothers and sisters, but only in Christ. That's it. That's where the crux lies. All right, here's another one. We don't have to read all the verses. Mm -hmm. You can be a partaker of the grace. Mm -hmm. You can be a partaker of the benefit. Mm -hmm. You can be a partaker of flesh and blood. Now, that's a very interesting one. Let's just go through Hebrews 2.14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power over death, that is, the devil. So Christ identified 100% with humanity yeah. by becoming 100% human. Flesh and blood. Flesh and blood. And in that sense, we become brethren of Christ. That's, Beautiful. That's quite, quite a promise. Eh? Yeah. Now, let's get a little bit complicated with Hebrews. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. We are partakers of a heavenly calling. It's a very high standard yeah. that has to be reached. You become a partaker of Christ, but you also become a partaker of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. In other words, you must come into harmony with heavenly thinking. 
completely. Completely. Because that heavenly thinking is where we are going. All right. Now that heavenly thinking, is it in harmony with your nature? No, totally opposite. Now, Martin, when it comes to Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 4 onwards, where he says that you must become a partaker of the Holy Ghost, but if you turn your back on it, yeah. then you're actually crucifying Christ again. To be a partaker of the Holy Ghost must mean to be so convinced of the truth that to reject it afterwards mm. is actually crucifying Christ, Christ again. again. But the bottom line is you must be a partaker of the Holy Ghost. Okay, there's a lot of people that are very scared about the part that says the sin against the Holy Ghost. Yes. Maybe you can just briefly explain what that means, the sin against the Holy Ghost. Well, the sin against the Holy Ghost, Martin, is when you say that that which is of God is of the devil. Yeah. That is the sin against the Holy Ghost. Jesus said the sins against him will be forgiven. In other words, if you say, I know it's the truth, but I don't want to do it, that can be forgiven. Or the sin of not doing what, is, what you are told. Mm. But knowing that it's wrong, that's not the sin against the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is still telling you that it's wrong. That's the main point. But when the Holy Spirit doesn't tell you that it's wrong, and you actually think it's right, and that which is right you think is from the devil... Then, then you have is. committed that sin. So that's important, just to let people know that once you've fallen and you ask for forgiveness, that's not the sin that's against the Holy the Ghost. That's not the sin against the Holy Ghost, no matter how bad mm. that process was. But you have to become a partaker of the Holy Ghost. In other words, you have to receive the mindset and then you have the good news that if you receive that mindset, and the only way to receive it is through chastisement, mm -hmm. because the old nature must be clobbered out of you. If you don't have the ch chastisement, then you become bastards. And not sons. So if you want to have it, then you must be partaker of the chastisement as well. In other words, take it like a man. Yeah, yeah. Stop wincing. And this is a very difficult one. You must be a partaker of his holiness. Yeah, that is the main one. Holiness. What is holiness, Martin? Have you got a definition there's, for me of holiness? There's only one that's holy, and that's God. That's God. And the only one who has manifested God to us is Jesus. Jesus. So, so in other words, if you want to be holy, you have to emulate Christ. That's it. That's the only way. Nothing on earth is holy. Okay. It must be Jesus. So to be, be holy means to be in harmony with Christ. Mm -hmm. It also means, there's one definition that I quite like, it also means that you have to be in agreement with God. Yeah. And how do you become one that agrees with God? That means you must have worked your way through this Bible and even the hard verses, uh, yep. you must have mulled them over and thought to yourself, why would God do this? And if you've thought it through, then you will realize there was no other way. Let's say the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. Do you think there were many people who were displeased with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? For sure. How many Israelites were displeased with the destruction of Korah and his clan? A lot. Didn't they murmur the very next day? Didn't they blame Moses? Yep. So the ways of God are not always easy to understand. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand the character of God. Is it misunderstood today? Oh, <laughs> definitely, yes. Everybody uh, misunderstands mm -hmm. him, right? Why does God permit this? I mean, you take an insurance company. They yeah. tell you that when your house is flooded, it's an act of God. Poor God. Who said it was an act of God? Why wasn't it an act of the devil? Exactly. Hmm? Who did the destruction in Job's day? <laughs> Not God. He permitted it. 
he permitted it. Well, then he's to blame because he could have prevented it. <laughs> and you hear that as well. <laughs> you hear that as well. So, Martin, this is a very tricky one. You have to be a partaker of the holiness. Now, it's not enough to agree with someone. No. You actually have to do it. All right, I agree that eating this and that and the other is bad for me. I know it is, but I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. Agreeing is not, is not enough. Doing anything about it even. So if you want to be a partaker of the divine nature, uh -huh. then agreeing to, is essential, but doing... Adhering to or doing... Is, is just as essential. And Martin, will you be a partaker of Christ's suffering if you accept this truth? It's a promise. Whereby are given us unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Mm. And this is what we're going to talk about. Yeah. To become a partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And this is the state we must achieve before we can go to heaven. It's a tall order, but it's necessary, and that's the only way. And we may not be partakers with Babylon's sins. Mm. In other words, you must make right choices based on, on the Bible, right? So there are only two choices. You're either a partaker of the divine nature, or you are a partaker of her sins. Sins is the transgression of the law. And that's the choice that we have to make. Now, I'm sure that many would like to make the choice that leads to heaven. Mm -hmm. But it implies becoming a partaker of the divine nature. And that it requires some That requires effort. some effort, right? Mm -hmm. And if we are really very close to the end now, mm. and I believe we are. I Me too. History is winding up. When the call goes out, the bridegroom cometh. And the virgins wake up. Half of them don't have oil, right? No. And uh, did they enter? No. No. They ran to get oil. Yeah. But by the time that they came back, the door was closed. It was closed. So Martin... Before that takes place, isn't it necessary that we become partakers of the divine nature? Absolutely. So after the fall of man, Satan declared that human beings were proved to be incapable of keeping the law of God. And he sought to carry the universe with him in this belief. Satan's words appeared to be true and Christ came to unmask the deceiver. The majesty of heaven undertook the cause of man and with the same facilities that man may obtain withstood the temptations of Satan as man must withstand them. This was the only way in which fallen man could become a partaker of the divine nature. So only by Christ's coming could we become partakers of the divine nature because he being fully human was also fully divine. Yeah. It's the only way. He had to come, otherwise humanity would have been lost. And is there a war against that yep. in the world? Yes. Most religions deny the divinity of Christ, right? In taking human nature, Christ was fitted to understand man's trials and sorrows and all the temptations wherewith he is beset. Angels who were unacquainted with sin could not sympathize with man in his peculiar trials. Christ condescended to take man's nature and was tempted in all points like as we, that he might know how to succor all who should be tempted. In assuming humanity, Christ took the part of every human being. He was the head of humanity, a being divine and human. With his long human arm, he could encircle humanity, while with his divine arm, he could lay hold of the throne of the infinite. So, if you just study that a little bit, the only way to be a partaker of the divine nature mm -hmm. is by placing your absolute trust to achieve this in Christ. That's it. Because you can't do it without him. No. 
So in a sense, Satan was right that man cannot keep the law. Yeah. But he was wrong in the sense that if you are connected to God, you can keep the law. That's where he's wrong. So, All right, so the connection was severed when Adam and Eve sinned. That's it. But by promise, it was brought back, and then in actuality, it was brought back when Christ came mm -hmm. to this world. So actually, Satan is lying to you. True. Why does he not want to or cannot keep the law? Because he has no connection. No. He has no connection. He has no, he doesn't have the one that has the arm to grasp the infinite. All right. So if you say, I want that connection, you have to open the door. Yeah. But in order for him to come in, the garbage has to go out. Uh -huh. Okay. So insofar as we lack perfection of character, thus far do we fail of attaining that which God has provided for us through Jesus Christ. If we do not lay hold upon the provision of his grace, we shall have a cheap experience governed by our own impetus, changeable disposition. We cannot glorify God by our own efforts. We must become partakers of the divine nature abiding in him as the branches abide in the vine. So, Martin, how do you do this? That's The answer is right there. That's it. The only re way is it to, to cling on to Christ. You have to slot into it with him. All right. And when you do that, mm -hmm. you have to give up self. Yep. And how often do you have to club yourself to death? Every, constantly. Every day. Constantly. As long as we have a fallen nature, we will have a battle. And the closer you get to Christ, the harder that clobbering gets because it's going to be severe. And because the closer you get, the more sinful you it, appear in your own eyes. The whole time. All right, here's another question. What about without the divine nature? Everything that God could do has been done for the salvation of man. In one rich gift, he poured out the treasures of heaven. He invites, he pleads, he urges, but he will not compel men to come unto him. Mm. He never forces anyone, no. right? It's an invitation. Do you force anybody to come to your invitation? I wish I could. <laughs> 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 he waits for their cooperation. He waits for the consent of the will that he may bestow upon the sinner the riches of his grace. Reserved for him from the foundation of the world. A man does not build himself into a habitation for the spirit. And unless there is a cooperation mm. of man's will with God's will, the Lord can do nothing for him. Can you see how important it is to agree with God? For sure. Though the Lord is the great master worker, yet the human agent has his part to act with the divine worker. Or the heavenly building cannot be completed. All the power is of God. Yet all the responsibility rests with the human agent. For God can do nothing without the cooperation of man. The Lord does not design that human power should be paralyzed, but that by cooperation with God, man may become a more efficient agent in his hand. So the bottom line is, if I want this to work, my will has to be in harmony with God's will. Yeah. The, when you say, you mentioned just before, and I was thinking that we have to agree with God. But you mentioned also earlier that you cannot just say, yes, I agree, but not do anything that is in harmony again. Yes. Now, you're right. So if you look at this question from the point of view of wanting to become a partaker of the divine nature, you have to intellectually mm -hmm. decide that God's way is the better way. Mm -hmm. Your nature will rebel against it. Instantly. Let's say God's way, take the example that irritates everyone. 
if you eat like this, you will be healthy, etc., etc. So go back to the Edenic way of eating. Will mm. your nature rebel against it? Immediately. Immediately. So intellectually, you have to say to yourself, I am convinced that God's way is the better way. Mm. Then I have to ask myself the question, if I am so inclined to this other way because of my palate, mm -hmm. does that mean God wants to withhold joy from me? That's your question you have to ask immediately. So is God now a tyrant that is wanting to take this away from me? Or has my palate become so perverted that I do not appreciate that which is of a kinder, gentler nature. Yeah, that's, that's what happened. But All right, so what would be the next step then? You would have to say to yourself, if you intellectually know that God is right, mm -hmm. then you have to cooperate. That is it. So agreeing needs cooperation. All right, then you have to say to God, okay, I want to cooperate, help me. Oh, yes, because immediately the devil will say, you cannot do it. No, and why should you do it? Because yeah. God is withholding something from yeah. you. Okay, so you say, all right, this is bad for me. I'm going to take it away. Then you take it away and you've made an intellectual decision. Uh, that doesn't mean you will be jumping for joy right then. Not, But then as you get used to the new one, and you have become a partaker uh -huh. of this way, eventually, over time, if you look back to the old way, how do you feel about the old way? I look back and I am actually disgusted. Appalled. Appalled, Appalled yeah. right? But it is a process and it's not easy. No, because when you were there, you couldn't, you were actually making fun of where I am now. Yes, all right. Now, once you've achieved it, you've become a partaker and you see things as God sees us and you actually relish it. You think, wow, this is such a magnificent improvement in, in my life. Uh, are you then holy? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> because how many other areas oh. are there where the same thing applies? No, it's the whole time. Everything, yeah. right? Your temper, <sighs> your disposition, the way that but your, you speak and think. Everything. But I must also say that when you agree with God and you start cooperating with Him, some of those things get better. And okay. they re it's a constant getting better. All right. We're talking about end times. Yeah. We're talking about preparation for going to heaven. And let's say... If we look at this process and we look at ourselves, we see we fall far short. Yeah. Now, there are some things where we have actually adopted the divine nature and many where we have rejected it. Yeah. So what is it, what is it that we need to do in the time we're li living in? We need to do introspection. Mm -hmm. And we have to, like, uh, like David... We have to say, search my heart. Yes. See if there's any wicked thing in it. And tell me. And then wash me. Yeah. Tell me. With his Wash me. And then in order to be washed, I must actually go to the car wash. Yeah. I must permit him to wash me. Yes. That means I must permit him to take away that which is old. That's what every one of us should be doing at this time in which we are living. Though weak, erring, frail, sinful, and imperfect, the Lord holds out to man the privilege of co-partnership with him. Is that the solution? That's the only solution. All right. So, Martin, what are we? Weak. We are weak. Yeah. Are we erring? Oh. <laughs> are we frail? Are we sinful? Are we imperfect? All of them apply, right? So if this was a multiple choice, they would have to add one, all of the above. Yeah. <laughs> Believing in Jesus as his personal Savior, accepting of his righteousness by faith, the sinner becomes a partaker of the divine nature and escapes the corruption that is in the world through lust. 
But there are people that think that this doesn't require a change. You no. just put on a different garment and there you go. You see, that's where my problem is. Um, once you just agree with God, you have to become a co-partner from through Jesus. Otherwise... It's just going to just stuck where you are. All right. So the garment is not there to cover up your imperfections. No. You have to become a doer in order to qualify for the garment. Yeah. Okay. And then it is through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that the Christian is enabled to resist temptation and to work righteousness. Without the divine nature... Without the influence of the Spirit of God, man cannot work out his own salvation. This is so important. So your salvation is by faith and by faith alone, but it is made manifest by doing. Mm -hmm. And if you are not doing, then you have to ask God to actually enable you to do, yeah. or else you are rejecting the garment. That's serious. You have okay. to ask for help. Can you do a patchwork garment? Nope. A little bit of Christ and a little bit of you? No. Christ no. wore a seamless garment. Okay, because you, he said you can't patch the garment. No. Because the new will make the other one shrink or what other, no, whatever. Christ said without me you can do nothing. The fallen race could be restored only through the merit of him who was equal with God. Though so highly exalted, Christ consented to take upon him human nature that he might work in behalf of man and reconcile to God his disloyal subjects. Christ pleads his merit on our behalf. Now, there are people saying the devil says you can't. Mm. But this actually says you must. You, yeah. Now, when Jesus said to the lady called, caught in adultery, Go and sin no more. Mm. Was he telling her an impossibility? No. Hmm? no. Otherwise, what was the point of telling her, go and sin no more? There's no point then. You remember that example we use of the alcoholic? Yeah. You're an alcoholic, but you make a cognitive decision, I'm going to stay away from alcohol. That's it. You're still an alcoholic. That's it. But you don't drink anymore. No. So, if you do this in relationship to sin, who gives you the strength to actually do it? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does it, yeah. right? So, in a sense, the Holy Spirit actually is helping an alcoholic as well. Oh, for sure. Because without the impulse of the Holy Spirit, he wouldn't even want to give it up. No. Okay. So, whenever you still... Have a guilty conscience. You know the Holy Spirit is at work. Okay. So as our substitute and surety, he undertook to combat the powers of darkness in our behalf and prevailed against the enemy of our souls, presenting to us the cup of salvation. Bottom line is, in this warfare, who enables you to say no? Only the Holy Spirit. So if you are tempted, what do you do? You ask help. You run help. to Christ. Yeah. Right? Yeah. In fact, we are admonished to sing. Yeah. Sing a hymn. That's it. The devil doesn't like him. No. So the Prince of Life consented to bear insult and mockery, pain and death. Upon the cross of Calvary, he paid redemption's price for a lost world. It was the world that he loved the one lost sheep that he would bring back to his fold. The cross of Calvary speaks the amazing love of God for the sinner. He valued him at an infinite price, giving his only begotten son, that whosoever, I love that word, whosoever, believer the name should not perish, but have everlasting life. And if you realize this, then the rest follows. If the love of God fails to call forth a response from the human heart, if it fails to soften and subdue the soul, we are utterly lost. There's no reserve power. You see, so nothing else heaven can do. 
to subdue your soul is to really let God help you and not say, but I am only human and God knows my heart. And therefore, I can carry on what I have been doing before. We can. So this is really an appeal for thorough introspection and asking God to do for us what we are incapable of doing for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then not to forget, Martin, that he is the one who did it, yes. lest I become puffed up and say how great I oh. am. See, the devil has a lot of ammunition. <laughs> he always tricks you up. Because now you've really done good, but then <laughs> it goes back to you it instead goes of back to you, yes. Christ. If you take the glory to yourself, that's what happened to Solomon. Yeah. Solomon says, I'm young, I do not know how to come in and how to go out. And then later he became confident mm. in himself, mm. and that led to his downfall. And yeah. how far did he fall? <laughs> right down. He into barely the made it. He barely made it. Have you failed to respond to the pleadings of his spirit? Then no longer fortify your heart in hardness. Open the door of the heart to receive Christ, the best gift of heaven. Let not cruel unbelief influence you to refuse the heaven sent guest. Let not Christ say of you, You will not come unto me that ye might have life. With loving entreaties he follows the sinner, pleading, Turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die, mm. O house of Israel? So that's the bottom line. And this is where we should be in this day and age. All right. Now, there's a theory and there's a practical application. We must look at the practical application, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, we don't have to read it all, Martin, but we must get a certain message out of this. So what a blessed experience it is our privilege to have. The old temperament must be cast out. And when this work is complete, true spiritual gifts will be revealed in us. We must look and live. The influence of the Holy Spirit, ever thirsting, is the secret of life in Christ. Under its power, we are ever receiving and ever imparting. Martin, if you do not impart, then you cannot receive. No. So if you've received all, everything, you don't give anything back or try and tell it to anybody else, it's, what is it worth? All right. Will you often be rebuked when no. you impart it? Yeah, probably most of the time. All right, so that's part of the equation. Yeah, that's the sufferings that we've and read And then before. you can become better or better. Yes. You have to make a choice between the two. So under its power, we are ever receiving and ever imparting. That's very important. We have a great work to do for the Master, but if we keep ourselves in our own hand and do not trust the Lord implicitly, realizing that we are kept by His power, we shall find we have a job on hand that brings to us very little heavenly joy. So you have to be a partaker of the work, you have to be a partaker of the suffering, and you have to be a partaker of his nature. Now let's drop down where the Lord said to Abraham when he was 99 years old, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. Does that scare you? Oh, yes. Okay. Our work is to be of one accord. Mm -hmm. So if we want to be perfect, then uh, we have to ask God how to achieve this. Yep. Now, fortunately, Martin, when it comes to being perfect, it says our justification is by faith mm -hmm. in a risen, ascended Savior who is fully able to do this work in an instant. That's so. Whereas sanctification is the work of a lifetime. Still through the inworking of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Dream. So today, tomorrow, follow on to know the Lord that we may know that his going forth is prepared as the morning. 
This is the reception of the Holy Spirit, to know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Now, it's very important that we know God. Yeah. I'm actually working on a sermon. What does it mean to know God? If you know God, if you really know him, then you will want to emulate him. Yeah. And if you really want to emulate him, you will do the works. But it will never be you doing the works. It will be he doing the mm -hmm. works because we have a fallen nature and of our own nature we will not do it because we are selfish. Yep. And he was 100% unselfish. So Martin, how do you replace selfishness with 100% unselfishness? You can't. Mm. You have to live God Christ. has to do it for us. Yeah. So in other words... We have to reflect Christ's image. We shall love one another as he loved us. So all we can do is reflect his image. So it is actually he that is working in us. You know, the thing is also, we can say all of this, but how do you do it? How do you know what Christ wants and how, what his image is like if you don't study the word? Because if you don't study, you won't know what is all of the, his character like. All right. So you're right, Martin. And if we are Christ-like, then we shall not love as we love our neighbor, but as Christ loved us. So, like, so not like you love your neighbor, but how, how he loves your neighbor. Do you always love your neighbor? No. Well, you should. You should, but things happen. So, you, actually, you can say, do you always love your brother? The, the brothers, all of them. You have a number of brothers. Yeah. Are they always very kind to you? No, but you love them still. <laughs> you still love them. <laughs> you should do that with everybody. <laughs> now, that's you know the story of Peter where he fell, and Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's such a marvelous story because Peter admitted that he wasn't capable of agapeo love, mm. agape and love. He couldn't, wow. he couldn't master it. And Jesus asked him, do you agape me? Do you agape me? But then he came down to his level, do you phileo me? And he realized he couldn't. Yeah. But later in Peter's ladder, his final step is agape. So he's saying you can do it. Yeah. But he first had to die it, it, to it, self. That's it, because agape is unselfish love. Okay. It's so only other-centered. So we must have that love, else we cannot be perfect before God. Mm. And as Peter realized uh, that if you turn your eyes away from Jesus then you will never attain to it. Yeah. Unless we love as Christ loved, our candlestick will be removed out of its place. That, does that mean that we must even love those that are not very lovable? Well, does Christ love them? Yes. So that's your, that's your requirement. How about the Satanist? Do you have to have the same compassion that Christ had. How about political figures? <laughs> is it <laughs> always easy to love them all? It's never easy, but that's the thing. It wasn't easy for Christ either. All right. How um, You don't have to agree with what they're doing. And you don't have to love the sin. But you must love the person. All right. How impartial must you be in mm. order to love everyone? Completely, but that's not easy. All right. How, how impartial must you be if you want to... Save those that hate you. You have to have some endurance. Okay, so we need a daily conversion. Yeah. Especially if they've riled you up. Yeah. Then you have to ask God to put that love back into your, into your system, right? I don't know if it's the same with you, but the closer your relationship with Christ, it seems the more people want to rile you up. Okay, then you get to the point where you have to say, save me in spite of myself, mm. my poor, weak, unchristlike self. Yeah. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere. 
where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. Martin, you're actually at war with your nature. In the old time. It's a war. Hmm. So the greatest battle we all have to face is the battle with self. Yeah. And we cannot win the battle without Christ. It's impossible. So the bottom line is we must reveal that love that dwelt in Christ Jesus. So Martin, as we prepare for communion with heavenly beings, ask yourself, is there anyone that you really find despicable in the world? Mm -hmm. And then ask the Lord to make you feel the same compassion for that person as he had for that person when he went to the cross. Yeah. That's where you have to end up with. And if your answer is that you cannot, cannot do that, you've got a problem. then you've got a problem, right? You see, and that is especially like we've shown in the, in the past few weeks, the agitation in the world. That's the only way that that can be solved. But unfortunately, on this earth, it's not going to be completely solved. Jesus has to come. Make an end to it. All right. The world is at enmity. Mm. And the enmity is increasing. And at this very moment as we are sitting here, are there people killing other people? Yeah. Hmm? Are there wars going on? Are they throwing bombs on people? Yeah. All over the place. Christ unites in his person the fullness and perfection of the Godhead and the fullness and perfection of sinless humanity. There is not one iota of sinful humanity in him, because the Bible says he was without sin. Mm. And he said, the devil is coming and he has nothing on me. Nothing. There's absolute sinlessness. And will you have to be sinless to go to heaven? Yes. Mm. But not on your own. Not on your I own. I cannot stand there. But to have a spot without spot or wrinkle, that means without sin. But it can only be Christ's spotless okay. robe. So he met all the temptations by which Adam was assailed and overcame these temptations because in his humanity he relied upon divine power. Do we have that capacity to, to rely on divine power? Yes, we have. Therefore the devil is a liar when he says you can't keep the law. Exactly. Because he, are, he is actually saying you cannot have a connection with God. Yeah, that's true. That's what he says. Isn't that a negation of Christ? Yeah. So he's saying Christ has no, no purpose and no role to play. So you have to call him out on this and uh, call his bluff and tell him you're a liar. Exactly. And you can use Scripture to prove it. Okay, this subject demands far more contemplation than it receives. Christians strike too low. They are content with the superficial spiritual experience and therefore they have only the glimmerings of light when they might discern more clearly the wonderful perfection of Christ's humanity, which rises far above all human greatness, all human power, Christ's life is a revelation of what fallen human beings may become through the union and fellowship with the divine nature. So, it's not on your own. It's, it's only a, through only cooperation. Only through Christ. Now, have you tried to explain that to your wife? <laughs> or let me put it the other way. Has your wife often tried to explain that to you? Um, that I'm not holy. <laughs> <laughs> that you have to become a, a fellow of the divine nature yeah yeah but first you hear that you're not holy and then you hear the rest that you have to become part of the divine nature all right now what does it do martin does it rile you or does it lead you to contemplation <laughs> it's supposed to lead you to contemplation but that's I'll why you have a wife right that's why you have a wife and neighbors and all of these people. It's not good for man to be alone. <laughs> he needs to be corrected. Now, the Holy Spirit does it 
but uh, often <laughs> you get some they help. get a little bit of help. <laughs> we're going to be in trouble again. <laughs> well, no, we're but, laughing, but, no, but yeah. it's a very, very serious matter. And just by looking at our relationships with those around us, we can see how desperately we need more of a divine introspection. Yeah, a cooperation. So Martin, when Paul wanted to show the condescension of the Savior in their behalf, presenting Christ as he was one equal with God and with him receiving the homage of the angels, the apostle traces his course until he had reached the lowest depth of humiliation. So here is God coming right down, being subject to the wickedness of man. Mm -hmm in its extreme outpouring. Yeah. So Paul was convinced that if they could be brought to comprehend the amazing sacrifice made by the majesty of heaven, all selfishness would be banished from their lives. Now, did it always happen? No. No, because they didn't open the door. Now we're talking to fellow believers now. Those who want to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Mm. This is a very serious issue. How do we get ourselves to be accepting rather than those in the time of Paul were rejecting? You have to contemplate the majesty of heaven and if you see how he operated and what he did in your behalf, all selfishness should be taken away, right? Yeah. Well, I was just thinking, if you take when Christ was crucified, or everything that he suffered for, there was not one accusation through his whole life that was true of no. other people against no. him. Everything was a lie. And did he ever retaliate? No. So that makes, it has to let you think. Because we get very riled up when people do us wrong. Yes. Or even when somebody says something wrong. Yeah, when they accuse you falsely. And that happens often. Even, say, for instance, uh, me and my wife, if we, if we are talking, then that's most of the time where the problem comes in. You want, you had, want to retaliate. You want to retaliate. And that, so Paul showed how the Son of God had laid aside his glory, voluntarily subjecting himself to the conditions of human nature, and then had humbled himself as a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even the death of a cross, that he might lift fallen man from degradation to hope and joy and heaven. So is, is heaven on our side? Yes. Well, heaven wants us to succeed. Are we on heaven's side? No. Martin, this is not. a terrible dichotomy. How are we going to overcome it? We need to spend a thoughtful hour every day contemplating the life of Christ yeah, yeah. and then asking God to achieve the same in us. Clean house. Clean house. So he abased himself to humanity that he might reach man sunken in the depth of woe and degradation and lift him up into a nobler life. Mm. A noble life. So, Martin, if you are inclined not to be noble, if you're inclined to be morose, was Christ ever morose? No. Never, right? Not once. Does it ever say that he was morose? No. No. Was he sad? Oh, yes. Many times, Many right? Many times. He actually wept many times. And who did he weep for mostly? For his children, for the... Believing the that he's the Israelites. For uh, the ones who rejected him, yeah. right? So Jesus cares for each one as though there were not another individual on the face of the earth. Oh, that's beautiful. Can we achieve that? No, only Christ can help you to achieve that. Okay. Because, uh, and that is so, you cannot even think of that. No. If that were, if only you were living on earth, Christ would still have died for, have you. Died for you. So as deity, he exerts mighty power in our behalf, 
while as our elder brother he feels for all our woes. The majesty of heaven held not himself aloof from degraded sinful humanity, and neither should we. No. Everybody is a potential child of God. Yeah. Everybody. It doesn't matter how degraded they are. We have not a high priest who is so high, so lifted up, that he cannot notice us or sympathize with us. But one who was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So this is the preparation that we need in the time that we are living in. It is no degradation for man to bow down before his maker and confess his sins and plead for forgiveness through the merits of a crucified and risen Savior. It is noble to acknowledge your wrongs before him whom you have wounded by transgression and rebellion. Wasn't I once had someone say to me, God does not expect me to grovel. God does not expect me to grovel. Uh, God doesn't really want anyone to grovel, I would admit to that, but if you have, have sinned, you should be be able to bow down in repentance before God. Yeah. But uh, some people believe that they've been put in a position of power and uh, divine right of kings, for example. And they believe that this power has been given to them and therefore everybody must acknowledge it and they never have to apologize, but everyone must apologize to them. Yeah, you see... I think sometimes they take out of context the place where David didn't want to touch the anointed of God when he cut the mantle off from Saul. Yes. Because if you want to if you if you twist that, then you'll say, Okay, so you won't you once you're a chosen of God, you're untouchable. Yes. And that's not true. You have as a chosen of God, if you are God's chosen you still have a big responsibility. But David showed a lot of compassion mm -hmm. and kindness, yeah. which he didn't receive in return. No. But that's the nature of that's Christ. That's the thing. So, so that even makes it more. When you're in a responsible position, then you have so much more to be humble and a servant towards the others. All right, Martin. So... It is no degradation for man to bow down before his maker. No. Now, human beings are generally proud beings. And they hate to admit that they are wrong. And uh, if you are in an argument with someone, particularly someone that's close to you, it's sometimes even harder to admit that you are mm -hmm. wrong. But uh, it is not a degradation it is actually an elevation to True. admit that you were wrong. Oh, for sure. So all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us need to bow down and to confess our faults and our sins to God. We must confess our sins to God and our faults to one another. Mm. So it is noble to acknowledge your wrong before him whom you have wounded by transgression and rebellion. Remember, he's unfallen. Uh, it's very hard for man to perceive that there is a being that's never wrong. Yeah. <laughs> now, I have been in this faith for, what, 38 years, and I've never won an argument with God. No. I've lost every single one that I've had with him. It's not a good track record. No. Unfortunately. In terms of victory. But you know what? Satan has also not won one yet. No, he hasn't won one either yet. But And he won't ever. All right. Now, but often I want to justify no. myself. <laughs> we all, I don't think there's any human that has not tried that. Yes, and if you want to justify yourself, then you sermonize. Uh -huh. <laughs> my wife tells me when I pray and I pray long about something she says you, you, you're giving a sermon <laughs> God doesn't want the sermon he wants you to say to him where you're wrong Sorry. Or you have to fix it up <laughs> yeah God bless us all 
So it lifts you up before men and angels, for he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. But he who kneels before fallen man and opens in confession the secret thoughts and imaginations of his heart is dishonoring himself by debasing his manhood and degrading every noble instinct of his soul. In unfolding the sins of his life to a priest, corrupted with the wine and licentiousness, his standard of character is lowered and he is defiled in consequence. God is degraded in his thought to the likeness of sinful humanity, for the priest stands as a representative of God. Whoa, Martin, this destroys a whole religious system in this world. Yeah. So why would she write like this? Because the standard that God has and the holiness that God has is degraded to the level of a human being mm -hmm. when you do these things. That's why the Bible says the secret sins belong to God. You confess your sins to God. You are never degraded when you confess to God. But repentance requires that you turn from what you did and don't do it anymore. Mm. A human being can never forgive you your sins. No. Even the Bible says only God can forgive you your sins. So bottom line is, after serious introspection, it's time to confess that we were wrong. Yeah. Every single one of us. And even if we think we were right, yeah. then we were wrong in the way in which we portrayed this so-called right. So I would make an appeal to everyone in the church to have a serious introspection mm -hmm. and a serious confession. Not in terms of a confession to a priest, but an acknowledgement of wrong towards the neighbor and towards God. Yeah. Because when... Even in, in the writings of the Old Testament, Joseph or any one of them that were tempted to do something, they said, how can I do this sin against God? Mm, yes, yes. When in actual fact you're going to do something to man, you're actually doing it to, to God. God. So repentance, Martin, is very important. You should bring all of heaven that is possible to bring into your present life. He would lift man from the lowest degradation of sin up to purity again and restore to him his moral image. When the apostles saw the indifference of those whom Christ made such an infinite sacrifice, he inquires, Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? There's a power that takes hold of the senses of men and women that perverts their ideas so that they do not appreciate the love of Christ. You cannot afford to sin. The wages of sin is death. We must show to the world, by our lives and character, that Christ has not died for our sins in vain. And when we place ourselves in right relationship to God, then we become living channels of light to the world. Christ had said, you are the light of the world. Is the world in darkness? Oh, bitch darkness. Who's going to bring the final message the to humanity? The people that adhere to or cooperate with God. Okay, and if you cooperate with God, the Bible says here are they that keep the, the commandments, commandments and hold to the testimony and yeah. have the faith of Jesus. Isn't that what it says? Yeah. So in order to qualify for the latter reign, now is the time to make right. There's no other time. Now is the time to make peace. I was with a brother once, and we were walking along a fence. And another man appeared on the other side of the fence. And I greeted the man on the other side of the fence. But this person didn't even turn around. The other one walking the, with you? Yes, didn't even, didn't even turn around. And then we chat, I chatted with the man through the fence, and then he left. And I asked him, Did you, do you know the man? This is your neighbor. Have you met him before? He says, no, he's my brother. He's real brother. 
I said, oh, okay. He hadn't spoken to him in years. Yeah. In years. Now, probably the brother did something yeah. that hurt him, and maybe the other brother was at fault. But shouldn't we try and make amends and forgive? Would, what How would, hard is it? It's hard, but what would Jesus have done in that situation? Would he walk and just ignore if it was his brother? Probably not, right? don't think so. No, I don't think he would have done it. All right, Martin, so here's another point. If you have anything against a brother and... Uh, you haven't made it right, then go and make it right. Mm -hmm. If you have wronged a brother, go and make it right. And what does the Bible say when you go for a foot washing? Yeah. Make right with the brother if you know that there's a problem. And if you don't, you bring condemnation upon yourself. Now, is that only for a foot washing? How much more so for the final events that will be happening in this world. Mm -hmm. So let's wrap this up. Sanctification is not the work of a moment, an hour a day, but of a lifetime. It is not gained by a happy flight of feeling, but is the result of constantly dying to sin and constantly living for Christ. Wrongs cannot be righted nor reformations wrought in the character by feeble, intermittent efforts. It is only by long, persevering effort, sore discipline, stern conflict that we shall overcome. We know not one day how strong will be our conflict the next. Mm. So long as Satan reigns, we shall have self to subdue, besetting sins to overcome. So long as life shall last, there will be no stopping place, no point which we can reach and say, I have fully attained. Sanctification is the result of a lifelong obedience. Mm -hmm. What message do you have for the people living in this final generation. Well, definitely don't you cannot say I have attained. You cannot say I have attained. No. And if you cannot say you have attained, then that means that you must earnestly seek to attain yeah, it. That's it. Right? And if you earnestly seek, you will find that there are many things that need to be corrected. Mm -hmm. Many things. You have to look very intently into the mirror. And now's the time to make right with those that you don't actually want to so much. Okay. So, Martin, so if I have offended you in the last week, may I apologize? And if I did the same, I apologize as well. <laughs> okay. Is that enough? Or no. does it go beyond it to goes. those that you do not know and that you do do not necessarily want to reconcile mm. with. So brothers and sisters in Christ, now is the time to make right. The Lord is coming very, very soon. We are living in the final moments of earth's history and this is a very, very serious issue. If that door hasn't been fully opened, open it now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are living in the closing moments and soon there will be a loud cry and then the end will come. Help us to be not only part of the loud cry but to be a partaker of the heavenly nature. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.